You awake? You ready? What? Yes or no? Yes. All right. March 2021. OVH data center in Strasbourg burned down, took down a lot of websites in France and other bits and pieces. All the backups, or a lot of the backups, were in the same data center. Some were in a different data center. Great. Problem was, the other data center was right next door and also got wiped out in that fire. You've known this, guys? Right? Twitter was a victim of its own success for years. The last outage was four weeks ago or so. So we know what happened. They tried to keep up with demand. They couldn't. Facebook, human error, took down the entirety of Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram for about five hours. They had to go into the data centers physically because all the routers removed all the routes as they were supposed to do, just because the people did something they were not supposed to do. Yeah? Painful. So what are we talking about when we talk about resiliency? And what are we talking about the root causes? Right? Root causes, human errors number one. When something goes wrong, it's not your hard drive failing. Somebody did something they shouldn't have done. Number one, you're not monitoring well enough. Your hard drive runs full, your server stops working, you didn't know. You didn't have monitoring in place, you didn't have alerting in place. Happened to me, right? Faulty deployments, your monitoring isn't good enough, a deployment starts, rolling deployment, blue-green, and the monitoring doesn't pick up on the fact that your deployment just destroyed your service and keeps deploying until your entire service is down. Happened to us as well. So these kind of things happen all the time. And there's very little you can do about them happening. But you can do something about how you handle them when they happen. So resiliency is the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulty, adversity. Right? That's important to understand. Now, what does good look like? What do you think? Let's see a show of hands. Who does? Can your systems withstand AZ failures? Hands up. That's very few hands. Um, can your systems withstand region-wide failures? That's one, two, three, four, oh, quite a few. Very nice. All right. Can we withstand loss of core services? DNS, EBS, pick something. Yeah? Yeah? I don't see any hands anymore. OK? Good. Um, do you run game days with your developers? Do you take your systems down? and say, here, something's wrong, fix it. Yeah? Great. Do you run this every day, every week, once a year? Twice a year? Twice a week. Twice a week. Awesome. That's great. Game days are fantastic because they teach your teams to work together, figure out what's wrong, and figure out how to fix it. And so when then something happens in real life, they're ready. It's like training. Training is amazing, right? Do you run Chaos Monkey? I see zero hands. Anybody running Chaos Monkey in production? Minus five hands. OK. So why do you want to run Chaos Monkey in non-production environments? To make a point. To get your developers to realize failure is normal, and their systems have to be able to gracefully handle that, so that if stuff happens in production, which it will, the systems are ready to handle that failure. So. Of course, then you have to run it in production as well because it's more fun. Your systems should be able to handle it anyways and just proving a point. Do you stress test your systems on a regular basis? Like, take a system, run 200% load through it, and see what happens? There's a hand. One, two. You guys are good. Three. All right, it's very difficult to see from up here, so I have to squint and do this kind of thing. Last question. Are your change sets small? Or are they? Thank you. So, Great. What does small mean for you? Microservices. So six lines of code. Let's deploy the stuff. Right? Or is it six months of code and hope? Yeah. So mindset. What is mindset? Why is it so important? It's a person's group's way of thinking and their opinions. Now, let me take you through a journey that we were on. Right? In the beginning, when I joined the Payments Hub, there were three availability zones. There was um, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. 
There were RDS instances in multi regions. There were RabbitMQ clusters across multiple AZs. And people thought it was good, but it wasn't. Right? They thought, oh, if a failure happens, the system will recover on its own. It didn't. So some people said, no, 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 let's test this. So we did our first disaster recovery test. We ran load through it, snipped down an AZ. Don't ask how we did it. We just did it. And spent the next six hours trying to clean up the mess that we made. It wasn't in production. It was in a different environment, of course. Um, but the team said, like, holy shit, how could this happen? What happened here? So they found a few things. They fixed a few things. A couple of weeks later, we ran the same test again. You know what happened? Same thing again. Why? Because this time we took down another AZ and one of the master nodes that happened to be in a clean AZ first time was now in a failing AZ. And so all of a sudden we had another mess to clean up. Wonderful, right? So people started to realize that this is not going to be easy. The system does not heal itself. Our infrastructure does not heal itself. It doesn't recover on its own. It's a lot of work. So then we spent the next six months or so testing this every few weeks. And every few weeks, we found a new thing that failed. And we found a new thing that failed. And we found a new thing that failed. And we fixed them and fixed them and fixed them. It was good. Because then came summer last year, I think. And Amazon did this for us in production. Yeah, they had a fire or what they called a thermal event in the, in the data center. Yeah, and that took down an AZ. Boom, like that. Now, if that had happened six months before, we would have been in a bad place. This time, the systems kept processing the payments. I think we had six payments that we had to process afterwards. We we're doing faster payments, so a few thousands and thousands and thousands of those. So we we're good. And the team realized that all this work all these assumptions that they had before, the way of, ah, this will work, this will work, this will work. No, you have to make sure it does. You have to work on it really, really hard, and it's a journey. It doesn't come like, we designed this on a drawing board and it works. Oh no. Test, 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 test. You think it works? It's not. So, that's helpful. So that happens, and then we started to see what's next. So we can now survive an AZ white outage, great. That's not good enough. What if DNS fails in London? Or networking fails? Or something else fails? Then our faces are still on the newspaper the next day. And we can't have that. We're processing payments. They're essential. They're systemic services for a country. They can't fail. They have to work. I have to be able to go and pay my taxi. I have to pay my shopping bill. I can't wait five hours until we restore service. That's not an option. So we now, in the middle, we've launched MVP for multi-region, so we can survive more or less multi-region-wide outages now as well for most of the stuff. Um, once we have that in place, the logic consequence is then, let's go multiple clouds, because if I run Kubernetes here and there in two regions, and I have Cockroach and Vault and Kubernetes and blah, 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 I can spin this up in Google. Yes, it's work. I know how to do this. Huh? And then I can say, well, if Amazon has a two-region outage, never happens in Amazon, right? Never. What? Never. never ever, right? Apart from the time that they took down LA and um, the other one with DNS failure. Two regions failed simultaneously. So we can't have that happening either. So multi-cloud is your answer there. Running active, active, active across as many as you can. It's hard work, but it's necessary. All right, that was mindset. So the team changed their mindset completely. Culture, and culture for me, it's not your fruit baskets, your kickers. They're nice things to have, but culture truly is the behaviors that you reward, you tolerate, and you sanction. If you tolerate that your developers do not write tests, well, that's your culture. That's how you run your company. And if you as a developer tolerate that your PO tells you not to do testing or to cut corners, that's your culture. And that's your responsibility collectively to fix it. Get it right. B 
because it's your only defense against adversity. So, that sounds familiar to some people. If you have a culture where you say, it's not my problem, I've written my code, he has to test that it works, he has to make it secure, he has to do this, he has to do that. If you're in that scenario, if you're not using cross-functional teams, you have a problem that you need to solve. Observability. If you can't see what happens in your systems, you're flying blind. Right? You don't know that your systems are under attack from attackers or from failures. You don't know. And if you don't know, then you can't fix it before it has big impact, and you can't build systems that fix it for you before it has a big impact. Yeah? And of course, region-wide failures, or any types of failures, they never like turn the lights off. Oh no, they're much more annoying. Error rates start creeping up. Some things fail here a little bit, latency increases. And you have to make, or your systems actually, have to make choices. What's going on here? Do I need to take action? Do I need to shift load, or am I fine? It's annoying. Good observability can help you with that. And it's absolutely necessary to have it in place. And it has real time, everything, all the time. Right? Curiosity, culture. Do you encourage your developers to try stuff? Do you give them time? Do you allow curiosity to happen and to learn and to teach? Or do you say, hey, we have to get this feature out tomorrow, forget about it. It's your choice, how you want to run your company, what behaviors you want to reward. Everything is code. It's an absolute must. Don't try it without this. If you try to say, let's spin up a system and run destructive testing on it, like you're supposed to do with Dora every year or so, fine. And it takes you six months to build it, two minutes to tear it down, to, to break it, and then you say, now what? And can we apply the lessons learned? Yeah, it's gonna take us six months to build it again. You're not learning anything. You're not making anything better. So if you cannot go click, and there's your environment, an hour later or so, so you can run destructive testing on this, on all kinds of other testing, you're not ready. Yeah. It's hard, it's a lot of work, and I know automation is important. Focus, don't be like Berlin. I used to live in Berlin before I moved to London, and um, went back a few weeks ago. And guess what happened? Berlin had more construction sites, more roadworks than when I left. And the other thing that happened is, they were still empty. There was nobody working on them. Some of them had been there for five years. So they have massively huge amounts of stuff in progress, only there's no progress. And if you do that to your teams and ask them to build 10 features at the same time and switch context six times a day, their productivity is about zero. Yeah? So you have to give your teams and yourself the time to actually focus, solve one thing, move on to the next, and again and again. Amazon did a study about that. They initially sought two pizza teams. That's the story. They realized it's not. It's a single-threaded leader that actually makes a difference between productive teams and non-productive teams. Where are we? Shared responsibility model. We had this discussion over lunch, right? Who's the res whose responsibility is it to say we have to write tests, we have to build things well. Is it the PO who thinks it's a PO? Nobody, great. Who thinks it's a CEO? Thank you. Who thinks it's the engineers and engineering leaders? Yeah, thank you, but exactly. It's super important that we all understand what is our responsibility, sorry, and what is somebody else's responsibility, yeah? This also works, by the way, of course, for the companies you partner with. Right? We use Amazon, and we consume it sort of at arm's length. We don't really have day-to-day -day discussions with them, how do we do this, how do we do that, because it's sort of understood. Yeah? We use Kafka, and we said, look, we need very specific guarantees, a cluster stretched across multiple regions with synchronous rights and blah, blah, blah. There's just no offering in the market that does it. We do it ourselves. And then we use Cockroach. We're still talking all the time, every week. The engineers. The engineers get together and say, 
how do we do this, how do we do that? So it's a very, very close relationship. We offload all the hard work to them, of course, like running the cluster and fixing it and you know, upgrading and yada, yada. We just use it, right? but that's, I like that. Because it's very clear, they're responsible for making it work, we're responsible for using it right. Very simple. Right? So that works, at least for me, personally. So, what have we found? There's things that work for us in terms of culture and mindset. Blameless post-mortems. Designing for failure instead of designing for hope. Yeah? And all the rest. There's things that don't work for us, that didn't work. And I think um, change approval boards are number one of that. Um, we have them. All banks use them and have them. I've never seen a change approval board that prevented a single thing from happening. Apart from getting the code into production early, so the team that just wrote it can actually fix it. Yeah? So get rid of them. There's been studies done that having change approval boards raises your change failure rate over having nothing in place. Well, even the automated testing. Matt talked about don't build your own tooling. I fully agree with that. But use whatever's there. Learn how to use it. That's important. OK. Every incident is, of course, an opportunity to learn. Right? So my call to action for you guys is very simple. Right? Understand what you're good at. Understand your mindset as teams today and understand your culture. And look at it and say, is that what we want? Is that what we need? If it's not, change it. If it is, do more of the same. Yeah? Invest in training and learning. If your engineers are flat out just writing code, they don't have time to learn anything new, they never get better at doing what they're doing. They never get big jumps in productivity because they don't have time. Learn the tools. Use a few of them, but really master the tooling. That's exceedingly important, because if you don't master the tools, stuff happens, you don't know why, you don't know how to fix it. Yeah? And allow your teams to really design for failure. Encourage them to do so. Force them to do so by running Chaos Monkey in your lower environments. It's super important, super helpful, something like that. Yeah? Just make sure it's like, oh shit. It broke. Yeah, why did it break? What do you think? Think it through. And then automate everything. At least everything you've understood. You can't automate what you haven't understood yet, of course not. But everything else you can and therefore should automate. Thank you.